Uh, if there's anybody who's visiting today who's perhaps wondering, where's Pastor Peter Kim? Uh, Peter and his family are on vacation this week, and uh, so I have the distinct honor and privilege of getting to deliver the message this morning. My name is Brian Wiley. I am a congregant here at church. I am, uh, I'm a member. I also happen to be the church chair, but I'm really just up here because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, I am back. We are back from a week up at Pilgrim Pines. Uh, there's nothing like a week at the Pines. Amen. Those of you who've been, you know what I'm talking about. If you have not been to Pilgrim Pines, go. Like, after church, just go. It's only two hours away. Uh, it's, our, it's our conference camp up in Swansea, New Hampshire. Um, we have been going up there for years and years, and we, you know, we met up with old friends. We made some new friends. Uh, we had some folks from who are friends of ours here at church come up and visit us while we were up there. It was just lovely. And I just have to give a little plug for the men's retreat that we're doing up there at the last weekend in September. Uh, it is going to be awesome. I got to see the facility we're going to be using. We're going to be in the Squanto Dining Hall. They're still going to have canoes. They're still going to have kayaks. There's going to be, you know, we can go play foosball. We can play volleyball. And there's going to be great teaching. So sign up for that, too, if you're a guy. Sorry, ladies. But Kathy's going to be talking about this awesome retreat that she's doing for, for the women in the beginning of September. So guys, gals, we got you covered. The last time I gave the message was the weekend after Thanksgiving. And, you know... I have been so encouraged by how many people came up to me afterwards and have made little comments about my message from that sermon. You remember what it was? It was people, people, people are just people, people, people. Every single one. And so many people have come back up and they've recited those words back to me. And that's wonderful. Because my goal whenever I give a sermon or I lead a class is for people to take something away from that that they can work back into their own lives. And that's become kind of my own personal thing too. And I say this a lot at work. I say, just take one thing away from this experience. And then I found out that that was the theme for THP, right Austin? They told the, the kids who went to the Hartford Project, find one thing. So, my goal for, and my prayer, and we're going to pray about this in just a second, is for all of us, including me, to take just one thing away from our time together this morning that makes your life a little closer to walking with God. One thing doesn't sound like very much, but just imagine if every week, either by reading a book or listening to a sermon, you took one thing away. At the end of a year, that would be 50 things. 50 things is kind of a lot. So, that's going to be our prayer, and I'm going to give you a fair warning. At the end of the message, I'm going to ask you to share with somebody what you took away this morning. So, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on each one of us. Make us attentive to your promptings in our hearts. Show us just one thing that we can apply to our own lives today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, well, today's scripture is just one verse. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And because I'm old-fashioned and because these are the words of Jesus, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And let's hear Jesus' words. Jesus said this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. 
So I'm going to start out this morning with a question. You don't have to answer it. It's rhetorical. What was the gospel that Jesus taught? What was the gospel? You might guess that he preached the gospel of restoration or the gospel of forgiveness of sins. And he did talk about both of those a lot. But that wasn't his gospel. I want to share a couple of passages out of a whole bunch that I could share to answer that question that I just asked. A couple passages out of the Gospel of Matthew, starting in chapter 4. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And then in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then later on in verse 19, he said, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then much later in, in Matthew 24, Jesus said these words, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And then just one more in Luke chapter 4, which is actually closer to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He said this, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Now, just to prove that I'm not making this up, I've got all these little colored tabs in my Bible, and I'm not going to expose you to all of them because that would take a while. But Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. The phrase kingdom of heaven shows up 30 times in Matthew and over 50 times in the other gospels. In the other gospels, it's kingdom of God, but it's the kingdom. And the kingdom was the central theme of the early church as well. You look in Acts, you look in the epistles, just a couple examples out of Acts. When Philip was preaching to the Samaritans, it says in Acts chapter 8, when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And then when Paul was in Ephesus, it says he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Three months on the kingdom of God. Wow. It's everywhere. Jesus was all about the kingdom. The early church was all about the kingdom. It was the gospel of the kingdom. But here's something really interesting. Does anybody know how many times kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God shows up in the Old Testament? Zip. Not once. Talks about God, of course. God's all over the place in the Old Testament. Talks about him as king. But you never find the term kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in the Old Testament. So when Jesus showed up and Jesus started preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was using words nobody had ever heard before. Not Let's just take a moment and pause on, on that sentence, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent's kind of gotten a bad rap, right? Sometimes conjures up pictures of people with signs on street corners. All it means is change how you're living. So if I put Jesus' message in modern language, it would be change how you're living because the kingdom of heaven is available to you. Okay, great. But nobody knew what the king of heaven was. So how was Jesus going to deal with this? Well, let's do a little make-believe. I want to pretend for just a minute, and I need you all to pretend this with me, that none of you, nobody at Trinity Covenant Church has ever heard of or used the internet. Some of you like that. So, right, you've never seen the internet, never seen anything on the internet, don't know anything about it, yeah, maybe you've heard of it just a little bit. And then I show up with my smartphone in my hand, and I say, change how you're living, because the internet is available to you. 
well, cool. You might say, well, this is great, but what's the internet? Well, let's see. I can't use Amazon or Wikipedia or Facebook or anything on the internet to describe the internet. So how would I do that? Well, I might say things like this. The internet is like a giant store where you can buy anything you want. Or the internet is like a library where all the knowledge of the world is available to you. Or the internet is like the editorial page in a newspaper where people can give their opinion on anything they want. I would speak in parables. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus used commonplace objects and themes and pictures that people could relate to to describe the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. There's about a dozen unique parables, depending on how you count them, that follow this format, where Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like something. And each one of them, he's trying to tell his hearers something important about the kingdom of God. So we're going to look a little closer at the story of the treasure buried in the field. Okay, so I'm going to make a confession here. My family and I like to watch The Curse of Oak Island. Anybody else like it? Got a few brave souls out there. Thank you, thank you. Um, For anyone who's not familiar with this show... I'm going to just read to you the narrative at the start of each episode. It goes like this. There is an island in the North Atlantic where people have been looking for an incredible treasure for more than 200 years. So far, they have found bits of gold chain, a stone slab with strange symbols carved into it, even a 17th century Spanish coin. To date... Six men have died trying to solve the mystery. And according to legend, one more will have to die before the treasure can be found. (laughs) Show's been on for six years. It's the most watched show on the History Channel. It's about Rick and Marty Lagina. These guys here, brothers. They've bought most of this little island and they're digging it up bit by bit to try and find a legendary treasure. They use explosives, they use these enormous well drilling things, that that pipe there is part of a well drilling machine. It drills like a five and a half foot size well hole. It's pretty cool, right? As a guy who loves power equipment, it's great. Um, Every episode might be the one where they find the big treasure. And every episode, they almost find it. Or they find a button or a coin. They don't find the big treasure, but they're so close. And those of you who've watched this, you know this. The show has the world's most annoying narrator on it. Right? (laughs) Right? Peace? And I frequently get to the end of an episode and go, why am I watching this show? (laughs) Well, let me restate the plot. Okay, let me try this. There's a treasure buried on an island. These guys found out about it, and they are spending millions of dollars to buy the land and find the treasure. Does that sound familiar? It's Jesus' parable in real life. That's why we love this show. That's why we love movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark or National Treasure. The heroes in those movies are risking everything to find some incredible treasure. Or game shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? We've all seen game shows like this. Have you ever noticed that the only way to go for the big money is to risk everything you've already won? You have to give it all. You have to put it all on the table to go for the big prize. It's just like the parable. 
We all want to strike it rich. We all want to find the amazing treasure beyond our wildest dreams. And that's been true down through history. That's what makes this parable so enduring. So it's easy to identify with the man in the parable, even though he's fictional. Right? Imagine you're walking across this field. Maybe you've walked across it a hundred times. And you stumble across the treasure. You realize nobody else knows it's there. You run off. You're trying to sell everything you can. You're trying to go find the owner of the property. You're trying to go do the deal before anybody else finds out so that you can have that treasure. Right? We can all feel that in the pit of our heart, right? We can all relate to that. That's what makes this parable so powerful. The man sold everything, all that he had to get that treasure. And the offer of the kingdom is worth more than anything we could ever spend. The world knows that that's what we're looking for, even if we can't put the right words to it. Look all around. Look at advertisements. How many advertisements are promising some earthly version of this? Here's just a few kind of mega themes of, of advertisements that we might see. Drink this beer, you hang out with the beautiful people in the ad. Buy this product, you'll never have to worry about your future again. This whatever product will make you look or feel or act like you're 20 again and you get to be young forever, right? Right? The world knows this is what we want. And they all promise to deliver. And people spend fortunes, sometimes literally all that they have, on trying to buy the world's version of the kingdom. But the amazing thing is this. Just as the internet is so much more than a store or a library, the kingdom of heaven is worth more than anything we can imagine on this earth. It's more than anything on a game show. It's more than Powerball. It's more than King Tut's tomb. It's more than all of it put together. The treasure is life with God. Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Or Paul, Paul's words to the Colossians. God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Or this passage from Hebrews chapter 12. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Doesn't that sound awesome? That's the treasure of the kingdom. So, what if we get this treasure? What happens when we get the kingdom of heaven? When it, we enter it, it becomes part of who we are. What is the fruit? The fruit is life. The fruit is love. The fruit is joy. I'm going to go back one more time to the parable. What did Jesus say of the man? He said, then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Why did he sell all that he had? Duty? Guilt? Nope. Joy. Pure and simple. Joy. The connection between God and joy is all through the Bible. Nehemiah told the Israelites, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And Jesus said to his disciples, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And Jesus was a pretty joyful guy. Just think about the story of Jesus meeting Mary in the garden on Easter morning. Don't you think he was pretty joyful? Yeah. The story of the gospel, the good news, is a story of joy. If it isn't joy, it isn't the good news. I think we're not very good at living out of joy. 
really hard to portray it in movies or television. And people don't usually walk around going, I'm so joyful today. It's something deeper than that, right? It's something that kind of deep down inside. And it's longer lasting. I want to try and illustrate this with two quick stories from my own life. From just a couple months ago. Um, This past spring, I had a really great week at work. Uh, Some of you know I'm a manager of a group at work. Um, Got a team of people who work for me. And that's a very important role to me. It's really important to me that the people in my organization like working where they work. That I take care of them. I try to help them develop their careers. I try to help make sure that they're doing things that are meaningful to them. And every so often, our company does employee surveys, like most big companies do. Uh, And this particular week, we got the latest set of survey results back, and the people in my group were pretty happy. And that made me pretty happy, because as a manager, I want to do good things for my people. So that was great. Um, And then that same week, I got a major project approved that my team had been working on proposing for over a year. And that was pretty great, too. And then, at the end of that week, I got a bonus. Like, wow, trifecta. (laughs) I mean, it was really good. And I was really happy for a couple of days. Um, But about a week or two later, I was talking to my older son, Chris. Uh, Chris is 21 now. He's off at college. He's, he's here today, but normally he's off at college. And you know, all of you who are parents, uh, parents of teenagers or older kids, you can relate to, you know, to the, the story I'm about to tell because we raise our kids to love God. We raise our kids to know the Bible. We bring them to church, Sunday school, VBS, all of this. But what's the question that we all ask when they leave the house? Did it take? Did it stick? Do they love God? Do they know him? And so I was talking to Chris when he was back home for a weekend, and um, we kind of got on the subject of spending quiet time with God. Um, And so I asked him, I said, well, you know, how's that going? Do you, do you, Spend any quiet time with God? And he said this. He said, yeah. Yeah, Dad, I do. He said, I have so many friends at school, and they have doubts and questions about their lives, and I find that I need to spend time with God so that I can be there for them and so that I can recharge myself. Amen. Amen. Do you see the difference in those two stories? Just look at my own reaction. I can't get through that second story without choking up. It's because of joy. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness is about the things of this earth, all of which are going to pass away. But joy is eternal. It's about eternal souls, eternal decisions, eternal outcomes, and eternal people. All those good things that happened to me at work will be gone in a few years, or maybe less. But the decision of a young person to lean into life with God, that has consequences that will last for eternity. I'll take joy over happiness every single time. And just one last point about joy, and this might be the most important one. True joy is impossible to keep to yourself. Think about a time when you've been overjoyed. Did you keep it to yourself? Probably not. Probably couldn't wait to tell someone else about it. I believe that joy is something that's meant to be shared. Just think about it. The Trinity exists in perfect unity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They exist in perfect joy, but somehow that wasn't enough. God in his completeness 
wanted to share the joy of his existence with other beings, ones created in his image, people, us. So he made this earth, this beautiful place where we live, and then he filled it with image bearers of God, people. And then when we rejected him, rather than leaving us in separation from him, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us to him. Why did he do that? He did it for joy. So if we, if I, were really filled with the joy of the treasure of the kingdom, I think it would leak out all over the place. I think I'd leave little joy trails wherever I went. I'd be kind of like one of the little kids up at Pilgrim Pines with a dripping ice cream cone, leaving a little sticky trail all over camp. Isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't he leave a path of healed, restored, joyful people wherever he went? Just imagine if we could do that. Okay, so Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. And the kingdom is like a treasure, the most wonderful treasure we can imagine. And the fruit of that is joy. So here's my question for you this morning. What if it's true? What if it's true? What if the kingdom of heaven really is worth everything? And what if it really does bring joy? So much joy that you can't help but share it with other people. What if it's true? You know, I think when I've, been, when I've preached in the past, I've mentioned that I love getting asked by Peter well in advance to preach on a particular date. And the reason I love that is that I literally get months to go really deep with whatever my passage is. And I get to meditate on it and pray on it and listen to God. And a couple of months ago, when I was sitting with this passage, God said to me, live like the treasure is real. So that's my challenge to all of us today. Live like the treasure is real. Live like the kingdom is worth everything. Live like the fruit of the kingdom is joy. And live like you can't keep it to yourself. Live like the treasure is real, because it is. So, remember, at the start of our time together, I was going to ask each of you to take one thing away from this message. So now it's that time. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment and ask him to show each one of us that one thing he wants us to take away that will be different because we were here this morning. And I want to encourage everyone, I want to encourage you to open your heart to this today. You know, it would be a shame to sit this opportunity out, to to have spent your morning here at church and walk away and, and be exactly the same person you were when you got here. Take this opportunity. Maybe you already feel like you know what this is, or maybe you have no idea. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Let's bow our heads. And let's talk to God. Okay, let's pray.